As global tensions escalate, the challenge of defeating Russia on the battlefield and in the strategic sphere becomes more urgent. The stakes are high, and the time for decisive action is now. Russia, emboldened and resource-rich, advances its agenda, not deterred by sanctions or international pressures, yet the resolve to stop its encroachment is stronger than ever. Our strategy? A comprehensive 360-degree plan that not only counters, but overpowers. Ukraine stands pivotal in this quest. By empowering and equipping Ukraine, we aim for a strategic victory that assures peace and security, not just regionally, but globally. This panel will explore superior tactics that outsmart the adversary's madman strategy, ensuring a lasting peace through unified, calculated efforts. Hello, everyone. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. And also thank you to the people watching online, as I have done in past years, an important audience as well. My name's Terry Schultz. I've been covering NATO for the last 16 years um, and the European Union as well. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. And I have a great panel. We've been discussing what we're going to say here. Um, today, and if, um, if the last panel sounded uh, slightly upbeat, I'm here to bring you back down. <laughs> Uh, because I've been watching all morning and I just don't see any other way to frame it, really. So we're tasked with discussing um, ways to defeat Russia in the field and beyond, um, as if somebody had made a decision somewhere to defeat Russia and didn't let any of the rest of us know, right, guys? Um, so I think that, that we were, we were um, tasked with delving into what PISM calls undefined policy toward Ukraine. And I find that slightly euphemistic because if you consistently provide too little to Ukraine to win for two years, um, is that just a series of, of coincidences or is that kind of a policy? And your policy is simply not not to do what it takes. I, I ran across this quote on, on Twitter this morning from Estonian professor Mark Kuldkep that I thought was a, a good way to start this. And he said that Western policy toward Ukraine is largely explained by the very human tendency to measure the cost of every action in all imaginable detail, but to ignore the cost of almost every inaction as long as it hasn't become blindingly obvious. And I mean, leave it to an Estonian to, to sum it up well. So. We're going to be discussing um, ways to defeat Russia, even though uh, it would seem that that should start with an ambition to defeat Russia. So we are going to do what Patrick Turner uh, called this morning, telling ourselves pretty little lies and discuss how it could happen if somebody wanted to do such a thing. So George Barros, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you have said that the, uh, Russia not only needs to be defeated in Ukraine, where it stands now, but that Ukraine needs to take back all its territory. That it, this isn't really a defeat if Crimea, if Donbass remains in the hands of the Russians. That this then sets the stage for a Russia-NATO confrontation before long. So, I mean, that's a, a pretty dramatic view given the way things stand now. I think it seems an impossible dream for the moment if you're Ukraine. But I'm very interested to hear how you think that could happen. Thank, thank you, Terry. Firstly, I, I'd like to thank the uh, Polish Institute for International Affairs uh, for inviting me here. It's my first time at the conference. It's a wonderful conference, so thank you. Look, the Russians are preparing for a major war with NATO. I don't know when and where Putin will make the decision, or if he will at all, but the Russian military is undertaking the steps to prepare for this future conflict. Um, the Russians are fielding anti-satellite systems in space, with which they only, they only have one application. The Russians have resurrected the Soviet-era Leningrad military district that faces the Baltic states, Finland, uh, and Poland. Uh, the Russians have a stated goal to form a, a number of new uh, mechanized divisions over the course of several years. And the Russians, you know, just now recently with uh, their contestion of uh, the way that the current naval uh, maritime borders are drawn on the Gulf of Finland, they are now staking an official claim uh, to change the borders. Um, I think the Kremlin is setting the conditions for the inevitable war. If we defeat the Russian advance in Ukraine, uh, then what that does is it sets us up on the shortest possible path um, to be able to, or rather the longest path to be able to evade uh, this conflict. If the Russians win in Ukraine, uh, in part or in whole, that is the shortest path to get us towards uh, this conflict. If the Russians hold what they have in Ukraine now, the Russian military occupies roughly 18% of Ukraine, they'll be able to use the territory they have as a lodgment for the future 
uh, renewed operations against Ukraine. Need I not remind us that the Russians used the territory, the lodgment that they had in Crimea in 2014, and the territory in the Donbas in order to achieve what they have now. The relatively stable front line that the Ukrainians have now is formed large in no small part because the Dnipro River is a major barrier to maneuver. If the Russian military gets to lock down what they have now on the left bank of the Dnipro River, then in a hypothetical armistice scenario, the Russians will simply bring all of their bridging equipment and logistic support elements right up to the edge of the river, and they'll be able to project further and go to Mykolaiv and Odessa. So really, it is you know, any sort of serious strategy that, that wants to evade the Russian chance to reconstitute, finish conquering Ukraine, and go on to larger uh, uh, targets is predicated on the Ukrainians absolutely must be able to defend the rest of their country, and at a bare minimum, the Ukrainians have to retake uh, the occupied parts of Kherson and Zaporizhia. I'll also add with the following. I don't actually think it's a pie-in-the-sky idea. I think the Ukrainians actually can win on the battlefield, and I think they can expel Russian forces from all of Ukraine. There are technical, uh, tactical, and concept of operations challenges that we must address to be able to achieve that. But the center of gravity for this conflict is not actually what happens tactically or operationally on the battlefield. The center of gravity for Ukraine is the decision-making calculus in Washington, in Brussels, in Berlin, and Berlin, and Paris, and London. And the, if the Ukrainians lose this war, it will be because those aforementioned capitals uh, did not take the serious uh, and necessary decisions necessary uh, to be able to enable the Ukrainians. The one final thought that I'll leave is that, you know, we, we had a really great discussion this morning about how uh, our fear of the Russians losing should not dictate our strategy. I would also add that um, the current ebbs and flows, the ups and downs of the Ukrainian battlefield should not dictate our strategy. So long as the Ukrainians still have the will and the capacity to keep fighting to defend their country, the uh, International Coalition of Free Societies that want to help Ukraine win, both for Ukraine's sake but also for our, our own uh, collective securities uh, reasons, we should continue supporting Ukraine. So overwhelming military force, overwhelming military support is your is – is, is still your option, even though, as you point out, those decisions have not been made in European capitals nor in Washington. That, that's correct. Uh, we can get into this in the Q&A, but there are, like I said, technical, tactical, concept of operations problems, and I think there are solutions to them. But the key thing that the West has to do for Ukraine is materiel. I mean, materiel is the key determinant. Uh, people get into debates about materiel versus Ukrainian manpower versus command and control leadership, and I'd argue that if you were to really boil it down to the key determinant, if the Ukrainians don't have materiel, then they're not going to be able to fight. They can have excellent command and control. Um, they can have no uh, force generation problems, but if you don't equip the military, they're not going to win. For example, the Ukrainians right now, they're in the process of generating uh, 10, 10 brigades. The current theory is that the United States will be able to equip about three of those brigades with mechanized equipment for, uh, with, with the recently passed supplemental. The Ukrainians, in theory, are able to equip another three of those brigades with equipment that is manufactured uh, in Ukraine by Ukraine. Um, and there's no means to equip the other four brigades. Those are going to become essentially uh, light infantry, you know, uh, not mechanized infantry. They're going to be put in a trench somewhere. And the idea that Ukraine is going to just have to, you know, essentially be held back by one of these key determining factors that that is materiel, um, it's, it's not actually going to sustain the Ukrainian ability to defend itself, let alone win. Okay, but Liana, this, of course, has to start with the decisions with the political decisions. Um, the Baltic states have long been advocating that the phrase, um, as long as it takes, should be replaced with whatever it takes. Um, and that's also what George is talking about. But is that politically possible? Defeating Russia starts in Washington, Berlin, Paris, Brussels. Yeah, thanks so much, Terry. I'm going to be a little bit provocative on whatever it takes because I do think we have to be honest with the problems and challenges we would face with a whatever it takes approach. Otherwise, it can turn out to be a bluff that Moscow sees through. And the problems and challenges that like I they're see, not seeing through this one now. Well, let's see how we can address the problems and challenges that we have. And I mean, the first dilemma that we have is that we have overestimated Russia's military and now are underestimating Russia's military. Putin might not end this war even if 
Ukraine is able to expel Russian forces from the entirety of its territory. I'm perhaps less optimistic about that than my co-speaker here, but we might also end up in a cross-border war because from Russia's perspective, there are real financial and economic incentives to continue fighting and obviously political and ideological incentives. If whatever it takes includes boots on the ground, we do not only have the challenge of US-Russia, potential US-Russia escalation, but also of our own populations being overwhelmed overwhelmingly against this. Even here in Poland, a majority is against boots on the ground. And on the third point, um, if we think that a defeat of Russia in Ukraine can result in a better Russia, we should also be careful with that assumption. A defeat of Russia in Ukraine will not lead to a Gorbachev emerging in Moscow. It can also lead to a regime which is even more aggressive and even more radical. It doesn't have to be, but it is a possibility. And I think we have to be honest with that. And the conclusions that we have to draw for, for ourselves from these dilemmas and problems that we have is that we should prepare for a long conflict with Russia that might not end with Russia's defeat in Ukraine, that uh, will challenge our own military capabilities, that we will have to continue sustainably, not only for two or three more years, but possibly for a decade ahead and prepare for that. And that also means that we have to think about Ukraine's victory not only in, in battlefield terms, but we have to think about it in political terms. And we have to think about if Vladimir Putin does not want to end this war, then we have to think what we can do on our side to bring Ukraine to its home and to make Ukraine a member of the EU-Atlantic Alliance. And um, looking at the NATO summit this year, I don't think we see positive signals that this summit really will be a step for Ukraine towards NATO. Instead, it will be a step for continuing support for Ukraine, but it will not bring Ukraine closer to, to, to a membership path. And that's what we have to work on on our side, um, instead of hoping for perhaps unrealistic change, changes of mind in Moscow. I don't want to get you wrong, but if I understand you correctly, you're saying that even if Russia were pushed out of Ukraine, even if there was a defeat on Ukrainian territory, uh, Putin is so determined to continue fighting that he would do the things that countries along the front line right now are saying will happen if he is not defeated. You're saying that this is an inevitable outcome, whether he's defeated in Ukraine or not. Am, am I correct? And if so, then, think, then that will re remove some of the impetus for actually defeating him in Ukraine, if you're looking at public opinion. Well, I think we should not be naive and assume that a Russian defeat in Ukraine will lead to a positive change in Moscow that we would like to see. And I think it would be a dangerous naivety for us to do so. Of course, a Russian defeat, Russian military setbacks will increase the domestic pressure. It can lead to Russian elites thinking they have a better future with another leader than Vladimir Putin, but even another leader than Vladimir Putin will probably be, and we've written about this, um, perhaps more of a Khrushchev-type leader than a Stalin-type leader, but certainly, as I said before, not a Gorbachev-type leader. And if we do not uh, sort of address this possibility realistically, but just hope that this war will end with a Ukrainian victory in two years with a major Ukrainian counteroffensive in 2025, and that will lead to positive change in Russia, and then our problem is solved. Um, that, that, from my perspective, is dangerous naivete because it does not prepare us for conflict with Russia, which may last much longer and will be, can be, even become much more difficult and much more complicated than it is right now. I promised pessimism, people, but Liana packed extra. <laughs> Um, okay, now moving, moving on to General Kroll, who said I can call him Chris. Um, looking from the military perspective, if we look at the building blocks of if there were a strategy to defeat Russia, has the alliance, have the allies individually or together um, put in place the building blocks of a successful strategy, whatever their end outcome would be, um, in this case, theoretically, that Ukraine doesn't lose, um, does that exist? You've been working on this for years as well. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, invitation to uh, these uh, uh, events today. Uh, at the very beginning, a small correction. I, I'm not Deputy Chief of Defense. I'm, uh, uh, I advise uh, uh, Polish uh, Chief of uh, uh, General Staff. Uh, uh, He's worked at NATO. He knows yeah. the, the line of <clears throat> I was Deputy, deputy uh, Chief of uh, Defense 2018-2020, and uh, my, my previous position was uh, Chief of Staff, Elijah John Force Command. So my, I, I, I will do my best to share with you 
my national perspective, but also uh, a little bit of native flavor uh, uh, as far as answer to your question is concerned. So, uh, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, and it, this was highlighted uh, uh, and stressed uh, during the, the, the whole day today, one of the most important prerequisites to uh, uh, win this war is to uh, ensure proper definition uh, of the end state or what we want to achieve as far as uh, Ukraine uh, victory is concerned. What does it mean uh, to defeat Russia? Um, from a military perspective, it is absolutely critical because this end state, uh, political objectives properly set for military uh, instrument of power on strategic operational level uh, uh, should uh, define at the end of the day uh, uh, proper defense planning and operational planning processes in the respective country and in entire NATO. So uh, uh, the, the, the political uh, uh, settings should allow military to define military strategic objectives. This military strategic objective should allow uh, operational effects uh, uh, definition and at the end uh, uh, military actions that are ne necessary to meet these uh, uh, objectives. Uh, so, from that perspective, this would help military to define scale of donation, transfer of weapon, scale of transfer of weapon that is required, uh, uh, quantity and quality of supplies, scale uh, uh, of training, and uh, 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 potentially even other uh, activities mentioned uh, uh, during today's discussion. Uh, so, uh, from my perspective, uh, as soon as we define what is, re what is expected uh, uh, from us military, we'll do our best to provide you knowledge uh, what kind of and uh, uh, what uh, type of ammunitions, in what quantity and quality we need, what kind of air defense systems we need, uh, how to ensure that uh, Ukraine will be able uh, to regain initiative and uh, uh, retake uh, uh, terrain. Uh, this will allow us also to ensure that Ukraines are capable uh, to uh, target uh, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, target uh, uh, objects that are in the uh, depth of Russian uh, 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 defense. But frankly speaking, this this is the way NATO would fight. So we should not limit Ukraine uh, 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 waging war in the same way as NATO would do so. So from my perspective, uh, uh, creating these political conditions will help us military to define proper requirements as far as uh, uh, operational plan and of course the, uh, 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 defense plan uh, 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 at the end is, is, is concerned. Uh, you're speaking in the hypothetical, the subjunctive, we would, we could, <laughs> we, the, um, that would be okay if today were 2022. I mean, WTF, Ben, really? Like, how are we having this conversation two years after the war started and you're saying that this hasn't happened? Uh, I'm saying that uh, we, uh, we uh, really contributed uh, uh, heavily to the defense of, of Ukraine with our uh, uh, donations, with our... We being Poland uh, or we being NATO? Who are you? I, I'm talking about uh, both NATO and Poland uh, bilaterally as, as, as well. But from my perspective, uh, uh, we did not... Uh, uh, we haven't yet created proper conditions for Ukraine to win uh, with our plans. I will say, uh, if we define what is required, we could, uh, uh, we military could easily uh, uh, um, uh, design proper plan, let's call it enhanced uh, uh, trident, uh, and try to define what is really necessary for Ukraine, what kind of uh, supplies, what kind of weapons, what kind of uh, uh, additional training, of course, uh, 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 supplies uh, uh, are absolutely critical in, in, in this regard. From my perspective, we help Ukraine to uh, 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 sustain, to, to, to survive, but uh, in order to win, that's another issue. Absolutely. And Ben, that's what, that's what we're going to, going to talk about. And Ukraine brings lists. You don't have to make up the list of what they think they need. Um, ben, do you want to take it? 
I do. Thank you, Terry. Um, anyone confused can look up WTF, which is a technical military term uh, later. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, as Terry said. Perfect. Um, it's great, great to be back here in Warsaw and great to be back at the Strategic Arc. And fittingly for an arc, our problems seem to come two by two. We have as long as it takes, whatever it takes, and they both suffer from the same problem because they don't define the it in there. And unless we define the it, unless we actually say that is victory, we're going to struggle to get to where we need to go. It's been clear from all the discussions today, we know this. The goal defines the means, and once we've set the goal, we will set the means. But as I said in a Chatham House session last night, for all this talk of political will, what we actually face is political won't. We won't define victory as the goal. And that is as true in Berlin as it is in Washington. And until we do that, we will not shape ourselves with the tactical means, the economic means, the institutional means to actually get this victory where, where we need it to go. So the question is, really, as it was put also in the panel this morning, how do we do that? How do we actually overcome that? How do we get from should, which we're all saying, to did, which is what those people in this room agree needs to happen? So I would put it to you that instead of looking in the same places, because we keep looking in defense places for this, we need to broaden our net a little bit and say, what are the things that are holding back Berlin, Washington, and others from committing to victory? Why is it in the face of the greatest clear and present danger that we've faced in Europe and in the United States, particularly in Europe, though, for a good number of years, we have still not been able to commit to the magnitude of increased defense spending and to sustain it over the period we think would be needed. Because we're not winning the argument with our populations. We're not having the argument with our populations. We're not making the case for this in a serious way. What we see in Germany in particular is now a discussion over the budget. When, you know, it, it's one thing when people around Europe say, or when I say to people around Europe, there's not political will in Berlin, they said, yeah. If I say there's not money in Berlin, they said, they look at me and say, come on. You know, this is obviously a self-imposed restriction that has been put on. We all know about the debt break, we know about the Schwarz and Null, et cetera. But that's actually not really the discussion that's taking place. There's a discussion between, for example, social spending on one hand and defense spending on the other hand as being in opposition or intention. There is a discussion between making the green transition and winning the systemic competition. We're not making coherent strategy across these different fields. You ask people in the Green Party, for example, in Germany, are you aware how dependent your green transition is on materials coming from China? What happens to your green transition if the US sinks a Chinese warship? It sinks your green transition overnight. Because as was mentioned this morning, the US will then ask people to choose sides. And Germany is so dependent on US security that it couldn't but choose that side. So I think we're not getting our act together in terms of actually lining up our different sources of power, in terms of making coherent policy across these different fields. And that goes to a deeper problem, and I'll finish with this thought for now, is that we're not actually giving our people a credible enough vision of where we're going to take them in the future. And we've just done some focus group research at the DGAP on this. Many Germans feel as though their country is in decline. They are concerned about exactly the problems we are talking about here, but they don't feel as though their political leaders are actually providing solutions to them that credibly address these issues. So there is a leadership void there. And much like in many other countries around Europe, there is political capital to be made for those who can fill it. But I'd suggest that we already have examples of how to do this. We can see where things are going wrong. We can see where things are going wrong in the, in the US, the UK, France, and Germany. We heard about this throughout the conference so far. But we also need to point to where it's going right. And we are in Poland, so let's start in Poland. The current government, reneging on its previously neoliberal positioning, not only continued with the peace government's defense pledges, but also in the election campaign promised to keep their social spending pledges too, keep people on board. We can see in Finland, it was mentioned earlier, the happiest country in the world. They have a societal model of defense. We can see in Estonia, spending 3.2% on GDP, but knowing they have to actually live up to the promise of a liberal society winning the systemic competition, you get the legalization of gay marriage. You get an effort to reduce societal tensions and divisions. This is not to say that things are perfect in these countries, but to say we can start looking for the elements of how to deal with this in a more comprehensive way by looking to our allies as they are. But we can also look to our history. And this is something I think is really worth emphasizing. Last thing I'll say in relation to that German debate on social spending versus defense spending. Look at our history in the Cold War. 
At the point of, in time when our defense spending across Western Europe was at its highest, we were building the welfare state at the same time because we knew this was a war we had to win on two fronts. We had to win that at home and actually make good on our promise to be better for our citizens than the alternative at the same time to defend it. So I think there's a lot we can actually learn from, but we're not doing it at the moment because we limit our conversation too much. I mean, I think this, again, was, was a, a thought-provoking discussion of, of what isn't going right, but we're under a lot of pressure, guys, to say, how do you get it done? This is the title of our panel, so we have to come up with, with ideas to make this happen. We know it's not happening now. So, George, how do you convince the, the people who need to be convinced that you send this material? We know that's, we know that's what's needed. So um, what's, what's your idea? Ways to get it done. Yeah, I think we have to be intellectually robust about uh, really nailing down and not being hand wavy about what the strategy is. I will make the argument the strategy, the strategic objective for uh, helping Ukraine should be decisive strategic defeat of Russia's invasion. Ideally, uh, Ukraine going back to the pre-2014 borders. Bare minimum, Ukraine must retain the territory in the south so it can defend itself, right? If we can agree on that vision, then – Everything else, uh, like General Kroll said, is very straightforward. The operational means become cl uh, clear, the tactical requirements become clear, and the equipment uh, re requirements become clear. But it seems to me that the current approach has actually, in fact, subordinated the objectives to something that's not that, that strategic vision. I don't know exactly what the, the key uh, objective is, but it's certainly not expel the Russians from Ukraine, because if it was expel the Russians from Ukraine, then the whole suite of systems and capabilities that we have incrementally granted Ukraine now would have been agreed upon much, much earlier. And by that, I mean the decision to send F-16s, the decision to send 300-kilometer range attackums, the decision to send HIMARS and main battle tanks. Like each of these things in Washington was an arduous, protracted pitch policy to debate. Do we do not send this one item? When any competent staff who understands that this is the largest combined arms war uh, in Europe since 1945, they're going to understand, of course, the Ukrainians are going to need F-16s to operate in the air domain after their Soviet-era MiGs were largely degraded. Of course, the Ukrainians are going to need deep precision strikes and fires. Um, and of course, they're going to need tanks for maneuver warfare, right? But it's clear to me that because we don't have uh, the agreement on the strategy, we're not getting there. Now, but, but the point is, how do we get to that agreement? That is exactly what I'm asking you. This is what, what we need to find out. This is what needs to happen. I think we have to think about wh what is the holdup? Like, what is the block? I, I can think of at least, I think, two, and perhaps we can contribute more, and I think we should dismantle them. I think the first one is we're concerned about escalation. We're concerned about what might Russia do that we don't want to do. And everyone, you know, we know that that's, that's the Russians potentially using a weapon of mass destruction or something. I would argue that I think that that risk is very, very low, and we actually can push back on the Russians. And I think the Russians actually use reflexive control techniques to get us to self-deter. The other argument, I think, is that regardless of what kind of support we give the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians can't actually win on the battlefield. Um, and therefore, really, the strategy should not be about since that's, since that's a foregone conclusion, the Ukrainians actually can't do this, then we should fundamentally not give them what they need. And I think that feeds into a, a, a destructive cycle loop, and I'm prepared to have the argument of why I think the Ukrainians can win on the battlefield. But if there's any other reasons why we should not come to that vision, um, I think we have to identify them and then you know, knock them down. But Liana and, and Ben, how do you get, how do you get Berlin to that, to that point where they agree? I mean, the, at the moment, everyone says on and off the record, there's no way Germany's agreeing to go uh, far enough. There's no way they're going to get there, which means we might as well go home now. So at, at risk of making myself unpopular here, no. <laughs> I, will say I'm loving I'm, you. I will say that I'm not entirely comfortable with just singling out the United States and Germany as sort of the main stumbling blocks, and otherwise we would have a Ukrainian victory. I mean, honestly, the United States and Germany are the biggest supporters of Ukraine in absolute numbers. Without the United States, but also without Germany, the situation would look completely different. And although I do think that Berlin should send those Taurus missiles that they don't want to send, even those Taurus missiles will not be the one weapon that can change the course of the war. And I think we have to be a little bit more honest that the situation is more complex and that it is not just 
you know, Washington and Berlin being self-constrained and everyone else being willing to put everything in for, for a Ukrainian victory. Otherwise, the numbers of support for Ukraine and other countries um, of, of, of Europe would look different if that were the case. And it also applies to the question of NATO membership and of sort of Ukraine's path towards NATO membership, um, turning the tables on all the other countries, um, which country right now would think about accepting Ukraine into NATO and thereby risking being involved into a war. I think we have to be honest about these limitations because uh, that, that not only the United States and, and Germany have, because if we are not honest about this, then sort of we, 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 we have a wrong analysis um, of the problem. And what I would offer as an alternative is that we do not only focus on sort of these single issue questions of Taurus missiles, of um, uh, you know, every weapons you can think of, but we think about the political future that we want Ukraine to be in, and I think this is what is missing in the debate because of all the short-term problems that we have, the U.S. supplemental, the problems, the budgetary problems in Berlin, the coalition problems, um, right-wing forces in Europe, the parliamentary elections. We kind of focus only on short-term crisis management for Ukraine, and are happy every time we sort of cut the corner, but we don't have a consensus on on the conceptual role of Ukraine in Europe. Do we want Ukraine to become what Poland has become? Right? Do we want Ukraine to be a member of the European Union and NATO? And how determined are we? What is our model for doing that? How can we think if we want to do it? How can we think realistically about a model for Ukrainian NATO membership? And instead of just talking about a bridge that actually is not a bridge, how can we speed up the EU accession process? Have we an answer to the question, can Ukraine become an EU member before it becomes a NATO member? What about Article 42.7 in the EU? How, how would that sort of play, play out? Um, we need to find conceptual answers political answers, not only battlefield answers. I would say it's not enough just to say it's the 1991 borders that have to be regained. We need the political answer first, where we want Ukraine to be, and from that political answer, we can deduce our action. As, we don't, as long as we don't have this political answer on Ukraine's role in Europe, then it becomes incredibly difficult to define the military targets because even in that situation, the political goal defines the military target. And um, that's, that's what is missing. And that will also doesn't seem to show up this year with the NATO summit in Washington and the U.S. elections and is postponed into the future. At the risk of making myself unpopular with Leanna, I'm going to push back on that a Just little fine. bit. You're um, not here to be popular. People. No, it's not, not the time to, to <laughs> make friends, is it? The stakes are too high. Um, okay, so even if you change the question to the political one, which is what I agree and actually what I was trying to do, so I fully, fully buy that, the location of the problem remains the same. Because, again, as, as Andrew Michter said earlier today, when we talk about Europe not doing enough, actually we need to be more specific. There's particular parts of Europe that are not doing enough. When we talk about Europe not being clear about what they want for Ukraine, it's particular parts that very much include Berlin that don't understand what they want for Ukraine. If you go to the Baltic states, it's eminently clear what they want. And they understand NATO membership comes before EU membership, but the two mutually reinforce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the question then becomes, why aren't we committing to that? And how do we overcome that? So this is what you're asking, Terry. Yeah. And I, th I think at the heart of that problem in Berlin, a small manifestation of which is in relation to Ukraine, a wider manifestation is in the overall lack of strategy, is that Berlin, or the current chancellery, let's put it very clear, does not want to see a world of systemic competition. They do not want to see the system transforming effect that they think Ukraine winning this war, being brought into NATO as a democratic ally against an authoritarian foe would bring about. Why? Because they don't want to change their trade model with China. Because they don't want to make the level of change that would be needed to actually get away from what has served Germany very well, or actually let me correct that, what has served German, some German companies incredibly well for the last 30 years. Now how do we change it? Well this is what we're looking at how to do in Berlin. One is you embed the arguments for security <coughs> with the arguments for the green transition, with the arguments for social spending, as I was making the, argument, the case for a second ago. The second is you have to make clear to people what they stand to lose. If this goes wrong, what are the costs that are going to be borne? What does it mean in terms of your freedom? What does it mean in terms of how your kids can live? Third is you have to offer that a credible alternative. 
a viable future that you can actually buy into and say, this is why we've got to win it. This is not just about sacrifice. This is an investment in a better future. And for that, you've got to have some credibility to do it. You've got to be able to link these things together. We're not there yet, but I think this is the bones of what we would actually do to then have a coherent strategy whereby your economics does not undermine your geopolitics, where it's not either or between, winning, uh, between managing the or mastering the geopolitical transition and the ecological trans transition. These things have to come together. We are facing all of this at once, and we need to deal with it. But too many people have got their heads in the sand and are pretending not to. And just very, very last comment on that is it's increasingly clear that the decisions that are being made by or influenced by very large multinational companies are not the same, are not the same decisions that you would make if you are actually genuinely reflecting societal and national interest. We see an overrepresentation of some groups in our decision making, and we need to push back against that if we're generally gonna, genuinely going to have a democratic strategy to win the systemic competition. Chris, just a, a, a question to you before we open to the audience. Uh, in the military, on the military side of things, um, are things much more clear to you? Yes, you can't do anything before you get a, a command from the top, a, a tasking from the top. But is it very clear when you're among the group of people who may have to go defend your own country if things go further south, um, does everybody understand that this is the best way to defeat your biggest, your, your, your biggest opponent? I, I mean, is this something that just simply isn't even questioned among military ranks? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that question. And uh, uh, allow me to answer um, uh, in a little bit broader, uh, uh, broader way. Uh, uh, we military uh, uh, used to uh, um, exercise strategic level planning. And this planning uh, uh, commences with the system of systems analysis. And my understand, uh, the, our, the general staff understanding at this moment is that uh, uh, these uh, four uh, centuries of uh, instability, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, uh, they uh, support uh, uh, each other and influence the rest of the world, uh, forcing uh, and forcing uh, uh, free world leaders or uh, uh, Western uh, uh, countries' leaders to uh, shift their main focus from uh, uh, real problems, dividing uh, uh, resources and forces as well into more than one uh, uh, theater of operation. The same happens in here in Europe. So. Uh, from my perspective, the whole system of problems is not only Ukraine, it's also current uh, hybrid warfare, Russia, uh, uh, supported by Belarus, uh, uh, execute uh, here uh, in Poland, in uh, uh, Western countries with uh, espionage, sabotage, uh, uh, with uh, 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 covert intelligence, with attempts uh, uh, to uh, uh, breach our um, uh, uh, communication systems, whatever. We must understand the pro that the problem is much broader than just Ukraine. In order to help Ukraine, we need to uh, properly uh, settle uh, uh, all problems related to hybrid war, to build our own capabilities to defend ourselves as well. Um, um, as a single country or as a, as a whole alliance. And from my perspective, this is absolutely critical. Uh, so we have to first focus on building our capacity and capability, uh, um, uh, developing uh, uh, our resilience. I'm talking about civilian environment, uh, maintaining governance, uh, basic services, uh, all that kind of stuff, from my perspective, is as important as support for Ukraine. And, and this ties into what Ben was saying about, about t taking the broader approach, because ultimately you need to convince civilians to elect people who make different decisions. Correct. <laughs> and if you explain to them that maybe you really don't care about what's happening in Ukraine. Okay, most people don't pay attention. We are a bubble to some extent. But you don't like it when, you know, your internet doesn't work, or you don't like it when you feel, you know, when there are food shortages, or you don't like all the other things that are caused by Russia. And I don't see that communication happening. But again, maybe I just focus too much on also on NATO and the military. But, I mean, elections need to happen with people who make different, uh, putting people who make different decisions in those spots. I want to open it to the audience because otherwise we'll just stay here and be friends or not friends and talk amongst ourselves. Um, it, it is very hard. Someone's waving their hand back there. Yes. 
it is hard to see up here. I saw every, all the other moderators doing this, and now I know why. Okay, I will take, um, at the moment, we have the luxury of 18 minutes and 46 seconds. So um, I'll take individual questions for now. So, um, please, not, not very long statements, and direct it to one of the speakers if you wish them. Isn't this rather simpler? Than I'm sorry, can you identify yourself? I'm Paul Short from uh, the UK. Isn't it a Ukraine. rather simpler question? Um, the, the reason why uh, NATO hasn't got a concerted strategy for a goal is that standing in the middle of the road to that goal would be Russian escalation and potentially nuclear release. Now, they may not do it. This may be a bluff. But the anxious possibility of that seems to checkmate serious political work towards solving this problem as a political and military one. Isn't that simple? It's a political I don't poison. I see it at NATO. I mean, honest to say, I'm, I talked to NATO. They do, they do not seem that rattled by Putin's nuclear threats. I'm a, maybe, the, maybe I'm wrong, because I see only the outward. But the nuclear posture hasn't changed. No, exactly. And we, we have every reason to make Russia nervous about that should, as well, should we choose to. We have credible deterrence. The problem is, in too many NATO countries and in our societies, the discussion stops at the nuclear saber rattling from Russia. We just panic and don't actually go into it. That's something we try and change in Germany, but I think we need a more general effort to actually address this. Well, it's convenient for those people who don't want to do anything. It's anyway. awfully convenient, isn't it? It's a very good excuse, and it's one that we see used time and again. Exactly. Another question here? Yes. I have, I have the mic, so that's, that's You're, useful. That's a power. Uh, Łukasz Kuleza, Polish Institute of International Affairs. A uh, question to, to George and possibly also to, to General Krul, because so far uh, there's been uh, a lot in this panel about the requirements on the blue side, on the Ukrainian side. But I'll come to the, to the red team, the, the Russians. How do you assess uh, the cohesion of the Russian forces and also the capability to sustain or even increase the, the tempo of the operation. Because a while ago, that was an army almost at the verge of disintegration, and they had to use Wagner, Wagner mercenaries to conduct the fighting. Right now, the narrative is sometimes, I think, over-exaggerated. Uh, but I would be wondering, where do you see the, the Russian uh, army as it is right now? Sure, I, I can go ahead and start with that. The Russian military is not defeated. Um, I, I'm actually kind of frustrated every time I see a Western le political leader saying that we defeated and denied Russia's objectives in Ukraine. Yes, so far, but it's, the game's still ongoing and, and the Russian military is not defeated. The Russian military over the last six months, they are slowly but surely restoring maneuver to the battlefield. They've made tactical gains west of Avdivka. They've opened a new major operation, uh, a supporting operation, Kharkiv, and they seized over 125 square kilometers in the course of uh, just under two weeks. Um, the command and control cohesion is poor. Uh, we don't see the quality of infantry assaults improving. They basically are running, you know, platoon, company, and rarely battalion-sized maneuver attacks, but cohesion's poor, discipline's poor. They're not using their standard Russian TTPs. Um, and there, I have no reason to doubt that the Ukrainians, if supplied properly, they can continue to deny those Russian advances. I will flag for you, though, that the Russian command is slowly but surely learning and adapting. Uh, one of the major problems on the battlefield now is the glide bomb threat. The Russian Air Force was largely absent from this war for the majority of 2022 and 2023. Starting in late 2023, the Russians started serial production for these cheap uh, glide bomb kits that essentially turned Soviet-era gravity dumb bombs into a, crudely speaking, a Soviet uh, JDAM. And the Russians use these at mass to destroy Ukrainian strong points in order to enable uh, infantry maneuver and make those sloppy uh, dismounted infantry attacks that more effective. And it actually works. And the Russians are now uh, replicating this tactic. This demonstrates learning. It demonstrates the ability to adapt. And the Russian defense uh, uh, industrial base is mobilized. It's on a wartime footing. They just got rid of Shoigu. They put in Bulosov, who's known as a shrewd technocrat and an economist who should be able to help uh, optimize Russia's war economy to sustain this effort. So I think if we actually help the Ukrainians and give them what they need, they should be able to deny it because the Russians, they're dangerous, they're learning, they're improving, but uh, not, not decisively so, not yet. Okay. Uh, if, I may, if I may to add to that, uh, uh, from my perspective, we have to take into consideration that uh, Russians uh, are not fighting in Ukraine uh, and not planning to, to uh, uh, conclude that they fight this year, next year, next five years if required. We have to take into consideration that they uh, create conditions for long-lasting war, uh, war of attrition. That's something Russians used to do uh, uh, and they get used to that. They have vast terrain, 
uh, huge population uh, uh, citizens are uh, just like uh, it, it was said a flash um, uh, and uh, frankly speaking population from uh, the rural areas uh, these soldiers uh, uh, come from uh, their wealth is growing because the, the soldiers are properly paid uh, so uh, the support from the population is also increasing uh, however uh, there is no doubt that uh, Russia cannot uh, build, produce, and develop everything. Therefore, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, this year, they simply requested support from uh, uh, China, uh, from uh, Iran, uh, from uh, South Korea. And this is just an example that uh, their stocks, their capabilities are uh, diminishing. Uh, and uh, uh, from my perspective, another, uh, another point is also that uh, Vladimir Putin, with the uh, inauguration of his presidency, decided to uh, uh, create conditions uh, for uh, uh, the proper uh, self-sustainment self uh, for the building industry that will be capable to provide everything that is required for Russian uh, 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 war machines. So from my perspective, we should expect that they will uh, uh, not only replenish, rebuild, but also develop more capabilities and more advanced weapons as well. I, there's a question here. Uh, Patrick, you deserve one since I stole some of your lines earlier. Thank you. So uh, one quick comment, two quick questions. Comment, um, George said, uh, I think referred to uh, we need to push, push Russia out at least of the south and maybe out of all of Ukraine. I think that either or is fundamental to address that and I think we should be saying very clearly to Russia it is our intent with all of our means that they leave all of Ukraine. Um, so uh, for me we need to say that clearly and now. Um, that uncertainty is really debilitating in itself for ourselves, for Ukraine. So two questions. Um, one, there was reference to 10 new Ukrainian brigades, three equipped by the US, three by Ukraine, and four without equipment. So who can um, equip the four? I'm sure we can, but um, ideas, please. And second, if the limiting factor on Ukraine uh, being sustained, surviving, prevailing, winning, um, comes to be at some point people and not equipment, what should we do? We have plenty of people, um, so boots on the ground question. Um, not necessarily to go to war, but at least help in Ukraine. Good. Liana? Um, I, can, I can take the boots on the ground question, and perhaps it's um, because... I'm a German sitting in Washington, D.C., why I'm a little bit more skeptical towards how realistic that proposal actually is and whether Moscow can actually see through this as something that appears as an European initiative as not credible to Moscow. And the problem with that is that obviously we have Macron who tries to position himself as a European leader, who tries to push the boundaries about what we can think which makes sense in a conceptual way to try to see where should Europe be at some point. At some point, Europe should be able to um, do its own operations, to send troops if they want to do. But at this very moment in time, without the United States, any troops on the ground are not credible from European countries. Um, and they are not credible because the Ukrainian army is actually the much better army by now than the European armies that we have. And we have to be honest with our military capabilities that our first task is to rebuild our own credible conventional defense before we can sort of go ahead with, 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 with propositions, propositions which then in the end will, uh, will and probably, um, inevitably uh, have to include the United States because if any European troops in Ukraine, even if not in combat roles, get hit by stray Russian missiles, it will not help to say, well, we have a European head, this is not a NATO head, because it will undermine the credibility of NATO in Article 5 if the United States would not react to that. So I think we have to be careful that by thinking about 
such initiatives, um, we are not undermining the credibility of NATO and of Article 5, because if we don't respond, if something happens, even to troops that are not combat troops, then we have a serious credibility problem, um, and, and, and there we have to be very careful to think this through. That's part of the weight on this proposal, right, Ben? But also, can you also address the sort of lack of vigor with which Crimea is Ukraine has been um, said <laughs> sure, reiterated yeah. lately? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, res responding to what Liana said, I think we can't let the perfect become the enemy of the good, and we can't hide behind the idea that Article 5 would apply to a training mission in Ukraine sent by a coalition of the willing. I, I simply don't think that would be the case, and I think that's a false excuse to, to use. So what we've seen very clearly is a proposal from uh, several places around Europe, including from four German MPs, three of whom we work with very closely, to use NATO air defense assets to uh, help defend the sky over western Ukraine. If you do that, you have a cover for putting in a training mission a serious training mission, and this is something that's been discussed by several European countries, including where Terry and I were last week in, in Estonia. And while I agree the Ukrainian military would have a lot to teach the Bundeswehr and other uh, European militaries, the, those militaries could still do an excellent job in training new recruits to become effective soldiers. And we need to put that kind of mission in at scale, as has been argued by people from Elliot Cohen to Jack Watling to many others, if Ukraine is to properly reconstitute its forces. Definition of victory again. I fully agree with what Patrick Turner said. It has to be all Russian troops out of all of Ukraine. But why are we hesitant to set that as the goal? Because we don't, or some parts of we, don't believe in our ability to deliver it or our willingness to deliver it. And that again has to be the issue. We are not agreed as an alliance or even as a coalition of the willing yet on what that definition of victory is. Well, it was easy to say at the beginning when it was, you know, constantly Crimea is Ukraine, Donbass is Ukraine. But then you have former NATO secretary generals coming up with plans that you would take Ukraine in without those areas. And then, you know, they're lost forever. Um, George, you wanted to come in quickly. Uh, to respond to the comment, I completely agree. Uh, all of Russians, all of, all of Ukraine is absolutely required. That should be the strategic objective. No disagreement there. Um, with regards to the 10 brigades, uh, the, you know, the one state that has to play and I think should play the strategic bridging role until European defense industry is ready to take more of a larger role in a couple of years, it has to be the United States. Only the United States has the, the depots with loads of tanks and loads of vehicles that aren't doing anything that could in principle uh, have utility by being shipped to Ukraine. But the United States and Washington, we've, we have not, we have made a decision to not do that. And uh, I think we, re we really should redress that. General Kroll, any, any trepidation about um, having European troops go in to Ukraine on, on a training mission? How would you and your colleagues feel about that? Uh, uh, this is really a very, uh, very complex uh, uh, um, question. Uh, I could imagine European troops on the border between uh, uh, Ukraine and Belarus uh, uh, in some kind of uh, the mission, however, the, the under what was flag. It, it, uh, NATO flag, this would be very uh, controversial. I would say. But for you, for, it would be controversial for NATO troops or it would be controversial to, to for, for Putin? It, it could be controversial for Russians. Yeah, but to, who cares? To, uh, I mean. Who cares? Okay. Uh, however, um, I would say uh, we lost the opportunity uh, a few months ago when Russians decided to uh, 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 collocate uh, tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus. We did nothing uh, as a NATO. Um, uh, so my point is, uh, what if we deploy NATO troops to border between Belarus or between Russia and, uh, and uh, Ukraine uh, in, in the part that is not uh, uh, an area of uh, uh, combat fights? Uh, from my perspective, uh, we could easily involve NATO in this conflict. Russia would do everything uh, to... to uh, uh, to change its uh, calculus to that direction. Uh, so uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, we, should, we, we must support Ukraine with all means, not necessarily uh, crossing, from my perspective, a uh, red line of uh, territory. However, I do not ex uh, uh, exclude um, uh, um, uh, fires or air defense uh, uh, capabilities protecting uh, uh, Western Ukraine. This is another issue. From my perspective, uh, this could just uh, um, uh, be uh, 
Uh, another confirmation that uh, all nations, either NATO or uh, on bilateral basis, I would prefer to do it uh, through NATO, that we simply execute and are capable mentally execute um, Article 51 of uh, UN Charter. If somebody is attacked, the country has rights to defend itself, and uh, whomever will support, uh, it is legal from my perspective. Okay, my panelists I all want to talk, so I was <laughs> going to take another question from the audience, but no, I just very quickly, because we're very short now. Yeah, just to what you said, I do think it matters whether it is controversial for Russia, not because we have to respect Russian interests or security fears or whatsoever, but because we have to think this through and cannot be less say, fair about Article 5 by saying, well, then these troops have a different flag or have a different hat, right? I mean, in the end, it is about European troops that if something happens, it is the credibility of the United States and NATO that is on the line. And so I think just saying they get a different hat or they get a different flag But then he scares, really, he scares NATO really into doing the nothing, problem. right? Sorry? But then NATO is scared into doing nothing. No. Well, I mean, uh, the, As if we want to go for it, we should have our populations ready to, that this might, in the worst case of cases, be an Article 5 case. Yeah, I mean, we should be making Russia care about a lot more. This is the point. Give them something to think about. Our response to that nuclear exercise, putting troops on the ground in Ukraine, thank you very much. You don't get to call the terms for us. We don't get to determine what happens with inside Russia, but we can contain its external effects. And that's another reason why we shouldn't actually fear change in Russia later. Uh, just last, last, last uh, opportunity to intervene. Uh, I uh, was chief of staff in Brunswick when uh, the war uh, uh, began. So uh, I do really uh, remember that, that we thought that NATO will be involved this way or another in support uh, to Ukraine, uh, even in training mission. But at this moment, uh, there is no activity, real tangible activity of NATO in support of uh, Ukraine. It's European Union uh, 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 a uh, military assistance mission uh, uh, in support of Ukraine, executing the training of the Ukraine troops, not NATO. Not uh, everyone NATO would be proud of that. Are, are, are in charge of that, but as an organization, as a chain of command, NATO is not involved. Is that good, Ben? Last thing on how we actually make the change happen that most of us in this room agree needs to be made. Allied pressure on those countries who have not yet moved to say victory is the it in whatever it takes. Let's get to it. Don't buy the bluff that's coming out of the Chancellery in Berlin that we don't respond well to criticism. I mean, sorry, you want to get beaten at poker by Olaf Scholz? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, right, so put the pressure on. Um, speaking of putting pressure on, I'm going to ask each of you for one concise idea, not about what could be done in some hypothetical world, what should be done right now. What is the number one thing that can be done, not should, what can be done right now to start changing this trajectory? George, I'll start with you. Critical reevaluation of key assumptions about Russian entitlements. Russia is not entitled to a sanctuary for legitimate military targets. Russia is not entitled to save face and be able to have a negotiated settlement where Russia gets to dismantle Ukraine's territorial integrity. Russia is not entitled to be able to deter our own actions by using uh, nuclear blackmail because it will only encourage other rogue actors who want to unseat the democratic, uh, freedom-loving states by acquiring weapons so that they can... Okay, that was fast. Case. Okay, Liana, quick. Okay, without wanting to make this an argument match w with, with Ben, I don't we think... Have I don't think... I don't think... <laughs> I don't think Germany argument. bashing would sort of end the war against Ukraine, but I do think what we can do is at the NATO summit in Washington set up criteria for Ukraine under which conditions it can become a NATO country. As long as we don't do that, the NATO path of Ukraine becomes a Bucharest plus version um, instead of a real NATO perspective for Ukraine. Chris? I absolutely echo that. Okay, that's just a ditto. That's quick. <laughs> So legitimate criticism of an inadequate policy is not Germany bashing. I want the best Germany you can get, and so do the German MPs okay, that we work with. Come on, ben, so play the what game. do we do? Who else wants this? A lot of German businesses who aren't the current tier one businesses. We work with them because they want a better geopolitical policy and a better geoeconomic guidance. That's, I think, how we should be broadening our stakeholder group and our vectors for pressure for change. Okay, I think this was very productive. I think we did a great job on talking about what can be done. Thank you very much to my panel. I really enjoyed this. Okay. I have Thank you very now, much. I have to go answer I'm some going questions. To rub the moderator over here. Thank you. Okay. 
like sorry, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to refer to your last question, actually, about the way how, how should we um, how, how should we um, do this? Um, who convinced you the most? Sorry, who convinced me the yeah. most? Well, I mean, I think they're, they're all convincing. I actually would have liked to have time to bring one more idea in that I was hoping would come from the audience so I didn't look like I was so greedy with the questions. But one thing that we didn't talk about is uh, trying to, to remove some of the funds that are pouring in to Vladimir Putin's war chest. And, you know, we're not, their sanctions evasion is enormous. The, the shadow fleet is illegally trading crude oil and earning billions for Putin. And yeah. some of the countries that don't necessarily feel so excited about possibly putting boots on the ground or even don't want to give more material to Ukraine should be in favor of enforcing the sanctions that they have already committed to in the 13 sanctions packages by the European Union, for example. Um, and that's not happening, and Putin is earning tons of money. One way you defeat Russia is by removing his ability to continue buying weapons and putting people back on the battlefield. And that's just something that I would have said. I, I'm convinced by that argument. But I mean, I thought my panelists were fantastic, so well informed. And, and I think they also brought ideas that we haven't been talking about. And that was really what, what I wanted to, to accomplish in the panel, and I'm so proud of them. <laughs> Thank you, Terry, for your insight. That was, <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you, Thank you very much.